Welcome to the Agency Insider Podcast. Today we have a special guest, Ali Squatch, a renowned growth advisor and an SEO expert. Ali is the author of the best-selling book, Product-Led SEO, and has worked with some of the internet's largest companies, including Tinder, Coinbase, and WordPress. Ali, thank you for joining us today. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so... Let's dive into your background in career for our listeners. So, Ali, you had an impressive career in SEO and digital marketing. Can you share with us how you first got into SEO and what drawn you into this field? Yeah. So it was, I would guess, a uh, an accident. They ended up in SEO like most people did. I was working yeah. at a company in affiliate marketing. So I was working with affiliates. My goal was to acquire more affiliates for the company to run the company's offers. Okay. and meeting these amazing affiliates and they're doing SEO. And I want to know more about what they were doing. And I had these affiliates that would show me how they did SEO and they sent me the links to the blogs that they read and learned about SEO. And I started building my own sites and I realized what they did was so much more interesting than what I did. And I began applying for jobs to be an SEO manager, but I had no experience. I'm applying for these jobs. I have no experience. And then I, I very fortunately got a job that I, believed I had enough experience to be tangentially related to SEO. So I had a job still in sales, still working on affiliate projects, but I had a little bit of responsibility with an SEO and, and it was, you know, off to the races from there. At that company, the SEO manager actually left. I took over their job uh, and, and that was the beginning. But yeah, that was not, it was never something I thought I was going to end up doing. Which year was this? The 2008, maybe. They were affiliate marketing's website then too? <laughs> Way back when oh, I started affiliate marketing in 2006. Wow. Okay. Uh, and uh, what were some of the biggest challenges you faced in your career? I, I think that the challenges I, I had then were nothing compared to the challenges that SEO has now. Challenges were really articulating and getting buy-in for the things I wanted to do. And I was able to do it because there was interest and there was desire to do SEO and there wasn't a lot of counter information. And I'd say now that challenge is even bigger because you tell somebody something and they say, well, I just Googled it and I read something or, you know, I read about SEO and SEO isn't a right. thing, but it, it was the same then. There was less of a belief in how things could be done, but once you articulated it, you got buy-in. Okay. And uh, who were some of your key influencers or mentors early in your career and how did they shape up your career in SEO? Say that the the biggest mentor uh, and just you know his material still out online is, is Aaron Wall. So Aaron Wall wrote a book called SEO Book, and I learned so much from that about how SEO works. And I'd say when I first started, I don't think there was a lot. I mean, Twitter was really wasn't around. I started following Barry Schwartz as soon as you know I discovered him, but I don't know how long he's been writing. Search Engine Land, Search Engine Journal. Moz. But again, I, I was doing things before any of these things really got big. I got to say, like one of the early things I did was I bought like the Moz training courses, which was just Rand speaking at University of Washington in a, in a classroom. Um, that was helpful. And there wasn't a lot of material. It was really, I was able to learn on my own. And I don't know that that's the case now. There's a lot of places to learn and read and you know, ingest information. I remember SEO book, uh, the website, and it had all the information. I remember that at that time too. Yeah, I remember. Because, because I started my SEO career in 2002. <laughs> I know how it went. Right? Yes. Yes. So, uh, your book, let's talk a little bit about your book. Of course, just I was uh, taking, I'm uh, doing a podcast with Nathan. You know Nathan Gosh? from Gotch SEO. He said that uh, he, before writing his book, he bought all the SEO books in the world, read most of them. And the only one book which he found makes sense was Product Led SEO. Oh, he never told me that. That's an honor. Yeah. So I had it on my podcast. So he said, I, bought, I, I read, he said, I've read all the books. I said, all, he said, yes, I bought all from Amazon. And the only book which made sense was the Product Led SEO. So I was impressed then. So I thought, okay, why don't I get you on the podcast as well? <laughs> That's where I searched and contacted you. Got it. I have to, I have to send him a thank you note. Yeah, sure. 
So your book, Product-Led SEO, has been, of course, very influential. Could you share how the concept of Product-Led SEO evolved for you? And what was the pivotal moment that made you realize this approach was needed? I'd say when I wrote the book, I didn't know that it was going to be a book that was widely read. I was just writing to write. So I have the same with my newsletter. Whoever's not following my newsletter is productledseo.com. When I started writing the book and I started writing my newsletter, it was just to write. There was no assumption that anybody would be reading it. And I had thought maybe when I'm writing this book, maybe a hundred people will eventually read it. I'll give it out to some people. So it was really my own ideas on how to approach SEO. And the reason I started writing the book was because I had a full-time job at SurveyMonkey, responsible for SEO and responsible for a growth team. And I, I had this unique approach to SEO, which wasn't driven around iterating on keywords, iterating on title tags and tweaking things, but really it was a higher level, let's build something around a user, build an entire scaled product. And I would, was meeting companies because there, there were always a lot of companies out there that wanted to hire consultants to help them with their growth. And I would explain to them that I didn't want to just fix one page or fix their traffic, but I wanted to build something around an SEO user. And they would always say, where do I find out more? And I'd been on podcasts, you know, the podcast that probably got the most coverage and the, the most listens is the Y Combinator podcast, where I talked about the product led SEO concept. And I would, I didn't have anywhere to send them. I didn't even have a blog. So I thought maybe I'll start writing these things and I'll turn it into a blog. So that way, when I have a conversation about it, I can point them somewhere. So probably one of my best read blog posts was this concept of product led SEO. I called it product led SEO and the blog post itself took off. And that's where I was like, well, maybe I should call this book I'm starting to write, Product Led SEO. But it, it was really that. It was a concept that I was always working on and, and always integrated when I did SEO. And if you read the book, you know that I was, you know, let's call it a victim of the Panda algorithm update in uh, 2011, 2012. And that's where I learned that maybe chasing the algorithm wasn't the best. And that's when I pivoted my approach towards SEO. This has to be something bigger. It has to be something around users. Um, really product led SEO is that, that approach of doing that and it, putting it into a book. Okay. Uh, so, uh, can you explain the core concept of product like SEO and how it differs from a traditional SEO approach? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we should have started there. So the traditional SEO approach is taking something in and optimizing for a user optimizing for Google, sorry. So let's say you're optimizing for an iPhone page. You're working at Apple and you're optimizing for iPhones. And what you would do is you would do some keyword research and you would figure out how to put some SEO layers on top of this iPhone page. Right. When you're doing product-led SEO, and, and iPhone's not a good example of product-led SEO. Actually, we can apply it in a different way. When you're doing product-led SEO, you're taking many steps back in saying, who is this person that's going to be doing these searches? And what does this searcher want? What do they want to buy? They want to buy a device. They want to learn something. And it, it's this integrated approach towards the user, much the same way every other marketing channel is an approach towards a user and building SEO around that and almost disregarding search engine best practices because the search engine is the medium to bring the user towards the, the thing that they want instead of doing SEO towards the search engine, which is backwards. You want to sell to the user. In that sense, let's say, you know, iPhone's not a good example. We'll extend that to something else, which is let's say I'm traveling and I'm roaming. I want to go to different countries around the world. So product-led SEO, instead of optimizing for what cell phone reception is like in Mexico or what cell phone reception is like in Canada, in writing this long form content page, that user probably wants something very specific. We're taking steps back. We want to know who that user is. That user is not a Canadian. That user is not a Mexican. That user is a traveler. So what does right. the traveler want? So let's build the product around that person. And what are they going to be searching for? And not, again, optimizing for queries. Because if you're optimizing for queries, again, if you go to SEMrush, Ahrefs, keyword, Google keyword tool, you're going to get the keywords that a Canadian person might search or a Mexican person might search, but right. that we're different. We're doing a persona. So maybe there, I wouldn't even do keyword research. I would just go to a traveler and say, you're going to Canada. What are the terms that you would search to see if your, your phone's going to work? You're going to Mexico. What are the phone terms you're going to search? And then build my product and content around that 
and it's a product. And in my book, I used examples like TripAdvisor, which or Amazon, which is TripAdvisor didn't build out a page for every single hotel and the right content the way most people would do SEO and travel. TripAdvisor built a product. And this product extends across every single language, every single country, every single property. They don't need to, you know, if a new hotel is created in New York, they don't need to create a new hotel page. They just build their, open up their product, you know, you know, integrate the pictures and integrate the description and in, allow UGC to start getting created. And Amazon's the same thing. When Amazon started, the iPhone didn't exist, but yet Amazon is able to have an iPhone page and rank on that iPhone page because they, they built their SEO within their product, which is what is the product page? What is the category page that we need to do really well in SEO? And let's have that. And our SEO will come from that. And then we'll, we'll populate it as necessary. And that's going to rank. And not okay. more than rank, it's going to sell. Right, right, right. So it holds so much value. It's like uh, built for user. Now what Google says, user intent, is that what exactly this is? Well, so, exactly. Because what Google's trying to do is Google's trying to connect users with websites. So right. you're not, you're optimizing for, you know, here's a better example, you know, presenting this concept. I think of search as a three-sided marketplace. There's three players in the market. There's the user, there's the website, and then there's the search engine. So let's right. think about Google as the broker, broker, you know, brokering that relationship. So right. imagine you're in a real estate market, you're optimizing your real estate listing towards the, to the broker. That doesn't make any sense. You, you yeah. want to optimize the listing towards the user. The broker is the medium. Obviously you want to incorporate best practices. Like in the U S we have this system called the MLS where you list out your houses for sale. That's the broker. So obviously you want to do nice things for the broker. So the broker can understand what it is you're doing, but it's the, the buyer that's going to be buying your house. So approach Google as the broker. What Google wants to accomplish is bringing users to your site. So you want to incorporate best practices, but Google's not your user. Google's not your customer. Right. right. That's an interesting analogy because now Google says, I mean, now everybody says build for user first. So that's what it led to, right? Yes. And it, yes. So I, I think a lot of people are paying lip service to the concept of user <laughs> first. So they're saying, you know, they're, you're not like, it, it's an easy question to answer when you're doing AI content. So Google doesn't say you're not allowed to create content with AI. Google just says, you know, is it helpful? Is it focused on the user? Right. So that's the question you should be asking. So could you write AI content as a product description? Of course, because the user doesn't need long form content. Should you write AI content to describe medical issues? Probably not because that's not what the user wants. So it being user first means putting yourself in the user's shoes and then writing and creating for that person. Not just saying, oh, we're well, writing, you know, we, we care about the user and then move on from there. So it, it just also combined what now people call as uh, SX or search engine, search experience optimization is that also comes into this, right? I'm not so familiar with that, but I, I don't, uh, I don't even. Basically it says the UI needs to be based on the user experience, give user what they want when they land on the page. So SX just talks about that you again, make it for the user. So that's what exactly a product led SEO would also be saying, right? Essentially, yes. The user has to be front and center into this right. in, the, in the entire concept. Right. So, so do you think in all this, the competitor, which is ranking in the top is also matters for the SEO or you don't need to look into not, that at all? Not at all. I never think about that. Yeah. Because okay. whenever I'm, whenever I think about industries with competitors, usually there's something about the competitor that I think I can do better. So therefore I want to just do that better. So, so let's say, for example, what people say that if you are optimizing for keyword A and you type it in keyword A in search engine, you see if the results are coming more of blogs or the results are coming more of commercial pages, you built your page around that. So that also matters in this or not? Yes. Yes, of course, because we're optimizing for the user. But this, I mean, you want to build for the user that Google has more data to understand what the user wants. However, Google does get it wrong. So if what you have discovered and what you see on the search engine pages don't align, but you have talked to the users, then you know that you should optimize towards the user because eventually the search engine will catch up. Right, right, right. 
Now, can you share some real world examples where product led SEO has significantly impacted a company's growth and what were the key strategies implemented by you? I don't know if I should talk about specific companies that I've worked on. I always need to get, get permission for that. But I, I would say, you know, I think the most successful example in the world is Amazon. So right. Amazon, again, if you look at all of, I think Amazon is built on the back of SEO. The reason that Amazon is Amazon is because when they first started, they didn't use advertising. They had a good experience and they had a lot of word of mouth, but it really was this early days of e-commerce and I did a search for a product and I found this website, Amazon, always number one or always number two. And that allowed you to experience it and, and you tell other people about it. So I would say Amazon is the most successful example of SEO ever and has built one of the world's most valuable companies on the backs of SEO. Okay. And now uh, you have consulted both B2B and B2C companies, right? My preference is B2C because I don't think SEO okay. is the best fit for B2B. Okay. And uh, how, how does your strategies differ when approaching SEO and growth in B2B and B2C? It's always the same. It always begins with the same, which is what is the user journey? What is the buyer looking for? What is the searcher looking for? And that's where I, I think B2B is more challenging because the searcher in B2B is different. So in B2B, if I'm buying an analytics product, you know, as an example of a company I worked for and you know, that I can talk about, I worked with Mixpanel. Mixpanel at the time was one of the fewer analytics products. Now there's a lot more analytics products. But if I'm buying an analytics product and I'm integrating this analytics product across my entire company and all of my pages and apps and all that, that's complex. That's not something that you do a Google search and then you just take out your credit card and you buy so the, the user journey there is I do searches, but I don't necessarily do searches to buy, I do searches to discover, and then I'd reach out to sales and then I you know, right. look at product specs. So I don't think SEO is the best fit. So no matter how much money you spend on SEO, you're not gonna influence the final sale, especially right. in that space where there's not many competitors. I'm going to do this process where I look at all the companies in that space and then from there, I make a decision, regardless of their SEO visibility. As another example, a company I didn't work for, Google, so Google Cloud, they only have two competitors in the world. They have Microsoft and they have Amazon. Google Cloud does a lot of SEO. You can Google, Google Cloud terms and you'll see they're doing SEO. I don't think that SEO makes any sense because no one purchasing Google Cloud is not also going to discover Amazon and Microsoft and then make a decision between the three of those without, you know, considering all the possibilities, right? So it does, SEO doesn't matter. So maybe SEO helps with a little bit of visibility, but I don't think it's worth investing into it. So Google could get away. Well, let's not say Google because they could do whatever they want, but Amazon could get away with doing no SEO whatsoever for their cloud product and still have the same exact business. So that's why I don't know that B2B is always the best fit for doing SEO. B2C is because that journey is different. Now the B2B depends. Maybe there's a, a social media product which behaves like B2C. Small businesses use it and they pay on their credit card. So of course, that's the kind of thing you do a quick Google search, you buy and you act like a consumer even though you're doing it for a business. So then I, I'd say you should do SEO. So really it comes down to the buyer journey and what the searcher wants. And, and when it comes to B2C, what for our listeners, what examples would be there? Uh, e-commerce e -commerce is a great example. So right. you have SEO visibility on e-commerce and they just buy. But again, B2C may not be the best fit for SEO. Say, let's say it's something like, actually, I'll, I'll give this example. I don't think restaurants should have websites. So restaurants are, yes, they're B2C. However, I don't think the process for discovering where to eat and the way most people are going to spend money at a restaurant is going to be impacted by SEO at a regular restaurant, maybe at a high end restaurant where you have, you know, experiential websites, maybe, but in general, the way most people are going to spend money on food is they're either going to Google it and they're going to go to a Google places page just to see where the place right. is located. Or they're going to go to something like Uber Eats or food, food Panda 
right? right? And just order from there without ever going to the restaurant's website. So the restaurants, they, they unfortunately spend too much money on their websites and no one really visits. And if they visit, they don't visit in the context of spending money, right? right. It doesn't change what, in most cases, doesn't True. change what they're going to do. And I'd say many, many smaller businesses or service businesses should not have websites for the exact same reason. A, right. a plumber does not really need a website. A plumber needs a Google Places page to say, here's my phone number, call me and I'll tell you what I can do when I can do it. Having a website with case studies, again, that could be an example where the plum a B2B plumber should have a website because a, uh, let's say, a, you know, a real estate company is looking for a plumbing company to be their partner in all plumbing, a website with case studies and materials might help. But a single right. plumber who works for residential doesn't need a website because I have a, a you know a plumbing issue. I don't want to look at websites and you know all that. I just need someone to come right away and fix it. So it comes down to buyer's journey. So B two C most of the time I think does matter. B two B most of the time I don't think SEO should be doing it. But obviously it goes down to the user journey. So when you build this product led SEO, it's more on page. Does any off page concept comes into it? Because buyer journey also happens not just on the website, outside the website as well. Yes, of course. So I think about off page as PR, not as backlink building. So I think we're in a world, you know, we just talked how long we've been doing SEOs. Google's Google's been around for 25 years. And initially when they created Google backlinks were very important and they were not multi-dimensional backlinks. They just looked at a link and they calculated its value. And they, you know, at the time we had it's Google like page, page rank. page rank, they calculated its value. Obviously not everything was visible in the page rank calculation, but they calculated its value and you get, you know, good links. And in theory, your website was ranked higher and it wasn't very dynamic. So if you were a plumbing website and you wrote content about popular books and you had a higher page rank, you could somehow rank higher on books, even though you're a plumbing website. Now we're in a world where we're in an AI world, of course, and the concept of links is so multidimensional where the most authoritative website in the world might have content out of its niche and it's not going to rank because it doesn't have the right dimensions or we're in a world where you don't even need a backlink. You don't need a hyperlink. You just need a mention because Google is reading all content and they can see that a brand is mentioned over and over and that creates sentiment. Or even more, they can look and say, this is negative sentiment. There's a, you've been doing SEO a long time. There's a, there's a famous case. I think it was 2010, 2011, where this guy figured out how to get backlinks by being terrible. So he would get negative reviews and everyone would write articles about how terrible he was, but they were backlinks. And the guy was, it, it was his, I, he was selling glasses, eyeglasses. And he was an idiot because he bragged about this, about how he got all these negative links by being terrible and ripping people off. So two things happened to him. One is, it was in the New York Times. One is Google saw it and figured out how to get rid of this whole thing. So Google can look at sentiment and say, uh, these are not good backlinks. These are bad backlinks. So you don't want this. And the second thing was he bragged about it and he was a terrible person. And he was ripping people off and he went to jail because the police also read that and they said, this is, this guy should go to jail. So it, we're in a day where they can look at sentiment. So I, I think that off page is necessary, but I think of it in the terms of PR, which is you want people saying good things about you and about your business right. and they can look at that. And I don't think guest posts and a lot of the things that people do nowadays matter at scale. So if you're in a low competitive industry and you get three more backlinks than your, your competition, maybe that matters. But if you're in a high competitive industry, I don't think you're necessarily going to move the needle by getting, you know, guest posts on sites that are fake. And does the social also comes into picture because that's also the sentiments also can be shown for Facebook, Instagram, all those. I don't think Google can look at Facebook and Instagram necessarily, but they certainly can in with Twitter because they get the fire hose with X. I, I, so I, I think they look at sentiment, but I find it hard to believe that you're going to get positive sentiment on one network and negative sentiment elsewhere. So if you're creating virality on Twitter, where Google can look, you likely have other avenues of virality that are showing positive things about the business. So it's, it's a holistic picture. Okay. 
that's an interesting device because most of the time people think the more the link is from higher RDA, the better it is. But it's not, of course, you said rightly that with a highly, highly competitive niches, it's not the case. Yeah, yeah. I, I came up with an interesting analogy that to, to you know, approach this. So are you familiar with the study that came out recently that said multivitamins don't do anything? Yes. So some health, they did a study that multivitamins, if you take multivitamins, you're no more likely to die older than if you don't take the multivitamins. Right. But multivitamins are still selling because people disregard that and they say, well, I should do it anyways. They don't know what they're talking about. I think it comes to the same with links. Many, many leaders, you can put, give them all the evidence and say, you're wasting money. And I do this all the time. I look, I show companies, I'm like, look at all these links that you bought. There was no data that showed this worked at all. And I'm talking about high competitive industries, low competitive industries. I think you can move the needle. And they say, well, I'm afraid to stop because there might be signals you're not seeing. So I'm going to keep doing it. So I think links are the multivitamins of SEO. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the measuring the success of SEO initiative. So how do you measure success of an SEO initiative, especially when the results are not immediately visible? And can you discuss some KPIs there so that businesses should track over a long time? So the most important KPI is revenue. So if you're doing SEO and not driving any returns from it, you're wasting money and you're wasting efforts. So that's the KPI everyone should be looking at. I don't know why businesses pay for SEO year after year and only measure rankings. Because again, I, I've seen this often where they say they're having SEO success based on rankings, but when I ask about revenue, they have no idea. So maybe that works for a few months, but years makes no sense. So that's the KPI. Now, if that's your KPI is revenue, you're spending money on it and you're looking for revenue, you want to look for early signals that you're going in the right direction. And right. rankings would not be one. Impressions would be. So you're getting impressions of search engines like what you're doing. Clicks would be. Page experience would be, would be something that you should look at. So that's the way I'd approach it. And it's funny when you look at the things people do in SEO and then apply it into another channel like paid marketing. So paid marketing is the exact same thing. You don't spend money on Google or you know, Meadow or Instagram, whatever, wherever you're spending money and say, well, look, I'm number one. I've spent all this money. I'm number, every time you do a search, I'm, I'm number one on this. They say, well, it takes us three months to close a deal, but we're, you look for positive signals in the meantime of, did they talk to sales? Did they open your emails when you sent them an email? Did they see multiple ads? Did they engage with the page? So yes, it still might take you months to get to a point where you make money off of that ad and it's profitable, but you're not going to use fake metrics in the meantime. And they, for some reason with SEO, they say, well, it's very hard to measure and it takes a long time. So in the meantime, I'll measure rankings. If, if it takes a long time, you should still find indicators that you're going to end up at the ultimate KPI. So, so the KPI when somebody starts SEO is more to do with the impressions and the clicks and of course the page experience and of course later on the revenue because at the end of the day, if your SEO agency is not selling you results in terms of tangible results, which are leads and sales, then I think it's a snake oil. Yes, yes, absolutely. This should be something you invest in because it has returns. And if not, that's okay, right? Like right. if it's something that you don't need returns from and you're just looking for brand awareness, just know that, but don't think rankings pay bills. Right, right, right. right. It's, it's just one marketing channel, which at the end of the day has to bring tangible results, right? Yes, absolutely. Right. right. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about international SEO. Have you done a bit of international SEO as well? I've done a, a fair amount of international SEO. Now I don't think of international SEO as a separate effort. I think of it just as an international version of SEO. Okay. Okay. So uh, of course, so uh, what are some of the most common pitfall uh, businesses faces when expanding into international markets and uh, how can they avoid? Them? I think the biggest issue is, is really not understanding the market. So if you don't understand the market, then you're doing your marketing to users that aren't a fit. So if you've mapped out a buyer's journey for your home country, you can't just translate that effort into another country. You have to re-understand those users 
and create a new experience for those users. So, um, you know, on a simple level, there's different ways of spelling words in the US and in other countries. So let's say the word color or favorite or optimization, understanding your users and understanding who's going to be reading that content. Maybe they care, maybe they don't care, but that's the thing that you should really focus on. The same goes with spending and credit cards and payments. You can't just say, well, I've translated my page and now anybody in the rest of the world that has visa will just pay. In other countries, it's more complicated to make payments. So you need to set up payment systems. Maybe you do bank transfers. Maybe you use other credit card companies other than visa, or maybe you use PayPal, maybe you use different things. But I think internationalization really comes down to what does this market need? Not I've just translated my page and now I'm doing international. That's the, I think the biggest mistake. Now, one of the common question, which we receive when somebody's trying to go international is do I need to have a separate TLD or do I need to have separate folders or do I just do geo targeting? So what is your take on that? Absolutely. You should not have separate websites. When I, ever I answer this question, I, I compare it to having two different houses. So if you have two houses, inevitably one house will be your nice house and one house will be your second house. So okay. if you have one website, then you have one really nice house and you have all the good furniture and, you know, every time you get some extra money, you, you know, you do a renovation and you keep it well-maintained. If you have two separate entities, one of them is going to be your nice house. One of them is going to be your backup house. And even worse than that, you have to spend more money because you have to furnish both houses and, you know, renovate both houses and have relationships to keep both houses maintained. So unless you are a billionaire, don't have both, and you have a team and you have different teams that manage your houses and your properties. Don't have right. two houses. No, but the where these things come from, because Google keeps on saying they favor local TLDs over the .com. So if you are in .co.uk, you have a domain .co.uk, which tends to rank more in the search than the .com. So does that also play or doesn't matter? It does. But I, ultimately, I think what Google wants is better websites and better experiences. So I think it's better to have a .com in a market where they favor the .co.uk than to have an ugly, well, not well-maintained, not good experience .co.uk. So if you're, again, example, if, right. you're, if you're a billionaire and you can have both, then by all means have both. But if you're not, I wouldn't have to, I wouldn't have to at all. A good example would be apple.com, which actually just has apple.com forward slash n forward slash UK. So it doesn't have a TLDs. Yes, I think that's a great example. Yeah. yeah. They just use HREF Lang to do it. Yep. So you are you a fan of HREF Lang? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Okay. Because I, I think that Google can account for things like language and localization without really needing HREF Lang. So if you have HREF Lang, I think you're giving an extra signal, which they may or may not regard. I'd rather be Apple and not have HREF Lang and in the UK have my English page, my, U, my US page and my UK page ranking. But if you have an HREF Lang, you might have them only rank the UK page or um, maybe rank no pages because they have conflicting right. signals. So I, I think in 2024, those kinds of things aren't that necessary anymore. Okay. And I'm sure somebody's going to disagree with me, but okay. I, I, I see higher risks to having them than not having them. Yeah, because going wrong with a chariot of link can definitely screw up your whole site. They're right. Because it's not a signal that they're going to take for sure. It's just a signal that they incorporate. Right, right. So let's talk about a little bit about current SEO trends. With the rise of AI-driven search engine and technologies like chat GPT, of course, search GPT coming next. How do you see the role of SEO evolving? I'm excited. I think the best thing for SEO managers and SEO consultants in general is this rise of AI. Because for the longest time, SEO has been take Google best practices and tell people to do them. And that's SEO. And I, I think the rise of AI changes the rules and makes the rules more volatile. So now, should you be optimizing for search GPT? Well, you, if you have to optimize for Google and search GPT at the same time, that's more complex. What are the rules in new Google, you know, in general with Google AI overviews and Google search? it changes. So you need an SEO manager to guide you. I also think, you know, there's going to be too many people that do SEO wrong because of AI. So they're going to say, oh, great, there's AI. 
Now I could fire my entire content team and just write everything with ChatGPT. Great. That's a good way to get a penalty from helpful content. And now you need someone from SEO to help bring it back. So I think SEO, this is the greatest time ever to be an SEO because our industry is changing. I uh, shared this on LinkedIn a while ago. I think now is like uh, being an epidemiologist when COVID came out. No one ever heard of this concept of epidemiology or very few people really knew an epidemiologist before COVID, but suddenly right. everyone wanted to know one so they could ask what they should do. Should I go to a birthday party? Should I wear a mask? Right. How long should I wash my hands? This is, this is COVID. This is COVID of SEO. The world is about to have a pandemic. We're entering this pandemic time and you need right. SEO. And I, I don't know that it's going to go away. This is, this is a global pandemic that will stay forever. You know, a good kind of pandemic for SEO. So I, I, now is a great time in general to be an SEO. And it, I, I think our careers are good for the, a little while. And the other thing I would, I would say is I don't think SEO ever dies because I, I think there's just always this concept of, I want to fetch my own information. So I don't think we're, we're going to be in a world where engines will feed information to you and just like, oh, I knew you were thinking about lunch and what, where you wanted to go for lunch. So here's where you should go for lunch. I think we're always going to be in a world where we want choice. We already want to ask questions. So today that world is I go to a search engine and I type a query right. in five years from now, it might be, I, uh, you know, talk to my watch or I talk to my ring and, but I ask questions and I get multiple answers, or maybe I have a conversation where the ring says, oh, what do you want to do? You're hungry. Or do you feel like this? And it, it, there's no automatic answers. And you're always going to be optimizing for the choice and making sure your choices show up front and center. So I don't think we'll ever be in a world where AI makes all of our choices for us. So yes, SEO changes from what it is today, but I don't think SEO goes away. Right, right. So, so what strategies would you recommend to business to st uh, stay ahead in this, of course, AI landscape. Hire SEO. I mean, you want to hire someone that really knows what they're talking about. Okay. I'd say the biggest, the most important strategy is to stay flexible. Just assume that everything is changing. Right, right. So the flexibility is the key here. Yes. Because if, if you cement your processes in and you insist that this is the way it's always going to be, you'll be surprised. The rug will get pulled out from under you. But if you keep looking forward into the future, even better, you're talking to your users, understanding what your users are doing, then I think you're, you're in the right place. Now, how do you think, uh, of course, AI has changed the word, but how do you think the word of SEO has changed now when it comes to AI? I'm afraid that most SEO is not changing fast enough. I think they're just looking at AI as, you know, a, a way to save time and be more lazy. So mm -hmm. I think we, we have to wait and see. I think the best SEOs are going to be the ones that adopt AI into their processes and become more successful and more creative, but let's see. Okay. So when it comes to processes, what, what all of AI have you adopted in your process? I'm using AI to do persona research. I'm using AI to understand users better. So I'm, I'm not creating content with AI towards nobody. I'm okay. using AI to understand who people are, what the personas are, and then writing human content. And I'm also using a lot of AI to write some scripts and to do regular expressions in, in ways I couldn't do before. So in the past, I would just Google and have to look at multiple sites and then right. experiments. And now it's pretty simple to just be like, hey, this is what I want to do. Write it for me. Are you doing any technical SEO as well? I think of technical SEO as not as its own thing, but as part and parcel of what I do in general. So when I think of, let's say, internal linking, I don't think of internal linking from a perspective of hacking the index or doing something sneaky. I think of it as what needs to be on the page to link out to other pages. So again, it's in the same process. Okay. Okay. So what are your thoughts on the impact of Google search generative experience, SGE? I mean, they've been trying it, uh, I mean, doing still in a trial, hit and trial move, but what are your thoughts on that when it comes to the SEO? So I think Google had to launch something like this in order for the world to not think that they missed AI. But I also think that Google knew about this concept of AI and LLMs. They, they claim they invented it 
for a very long time and they didn't want to launch anything because it disrupted their entire business model. So I don't think Google will continue to have as much AI on regular search results as we saw in the initial rollout because it, it hurts ads. It hurts their business model. There's no upside for them. So I, I think they'll continue to have it only on results that are not monetizable for now. But the SEO world should be consider themselves warned that they could launch it and broaden it at any point in time. If search GPT suddenly starts making inroads and growing their market share, expect Google to counter and do the same. So right. it's launched, it's ready, and it could come out at a minute's notice. Okay, right. Now, are there any specific AI tools or sites or technologies that you recommend? I mean, I, I, my favorite AI tool in general is just Gemini because it's Google and getting information directly from Google and how Google thinks. But I've seen, I've seen a lot of, you know, I'm in, I invested in a tool that makes TikTok videos out of podcasts like this. So there's a lot of interesting tools. I think a lot of tools will end up being features of bigger products. But in the meantime, it's almost like the beginning of, you know, the internet in Silicon Valley where venture money is funding all these ideas that will never be profitable. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, let's talk about some of the challenges and misconceptions in the SEO. Uh, so what are some of the common misconceptions about SEO that you frequently encounter and how do you address them? I'd say that the biggest misconception is the concept of even needing to do SEO. Like I said earlier, I don't think a lot of businesses should be even be bothering with SEO. And then the other big misconception is doing SEO wrong. So they're you know, they, they do technical SEO, they focus only on technical SEO, or they focus only on, you know, backlinking and not really thinking holistically around the user. So those are the two right. biggest misconceptions. So it's, it's more about SEO has to be think holistically, like, as you said, like a marketing channel. Yes. Not just in silos. Yep. Right, 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 right. And uh, what do you see as the biggest challenge in SEO today? And uh, in in terms of uh, this question is basically for agencies because this is an agency inside the podcast. So a lot of agencies listen. So what do you think is the biggest challenges in the SEO world today? And how can agencies overcome them? I mean, the biggest challenge is the same that that's always been really articulating value. And I, I think agencies are going the wrong way in today's AI world. So instead of saying, this is the new world, this is how we work and we help you in this new world, they're trying to deny that anything's changing. They just like, AI's overviews aren't a thing. Don't worry about AI or um, we can just create content with AI. I think agencies should be showing how this is a confusing world and how you need SEO even more and SEO expertise even more and really understanding the user and what that looks like in the future. So. I think a lot of agencies are afraid of AI and want to deny what's happening. I think they should embrace it and then use that to create almost fear with their clients and say, you need us more than you thought you did. Okay. So but do you, uh, so you can, what type of clients do you consult? Are they agencies also, or are they ma mainly B2C players? Mostly B2C. So later stage B2C kind of companies, like the companies you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, like Coinbase and Tinder. Right, right. So, okay, so do some AC, SU agency owners come to you for advice? Yeah, at times. I mean, I, I do a little bit of coaching on sales and positioning and, and how to integrate product-led SEO in an approach. So is there, well, my question was coming from, is there a panic in them now because of all this? Yes. I, I am seeing revenues declining significantly for SEO agencies. Yes, of course, there was a report in search engine land where the job market also for the SEO declined, of course. That's yeah, true. that's because it's not being articulated what the value is from SEO. Yeah, I think it's more panic rather than the actual thing. It's not that bad actual you use. Organic is still the cheap, I mean, the free channel. And uh, people tend to be panicking more. But I think that's the, if they are like in panic stage. Yes. So I, again, I think SEO is more necessary than ever. And I think agencies need to be articulating that and not um, trying to double down on things that used to work. Right. right. So what do you think the future holds for SEO? Except you, you said here yeah, the future is, uh, you are excited about the future. It's more... Uh, 
going to be more interesting. But are there any emerging trends that you believe will shape the industry? I think that there's a lot more granular search happening on Google. So I don't know if you've seen the bubbles or like you ask a question and like, let's say I'm, I'm look for an app and then there's a bubble that say, we'll say for Android, for iPhone. So that means that keyword research becomes less valuable. And I think that's something that's happening more and more. We're, okay. We used to call that long tail. And now I think long tail is search, which makes it harder to do keyword research. And I think this trend means that you have to focus even more on the user. Okay. And in your recent post, you did mention uh, SEO going to be more expensive if you're doing into PPC. What, so what, what exactly would that be? You're talking about LinkedIn posts. So I posted on LinkedIn yeah. that if you think PPC is expensive, then SEO is even more expensive. And that comment is really, I was talking to a startup founder who told me they want to do SEO because they can't afford PPC. And to me, that makes no sense because I think PPC is more profitable early on than SEO. Right. So right. if you know who your user is, let's say you're selling, we talked analytics, let's say you're selling analytics, right? you know what your LTV is. Let's say you have a monthly subscription and each of your users will be with you for 10 months. So right. multiply your monthly subscription times 10 months and that's your LTV right. for each user. So you can basically right. spend up to that LTV to break even on PPC or, or any other paid search engine. That, that's, that's your model. That's what you need to buy. But if you're doing, if you're saying that's too expensive, I'm just going to do SEO. SEO is just like throwing spaghetti at the wall. If you don't know what your model is to go and, and buy it. So if you know what your exact model is, you know, I need to find users that will be with me for 10 months, then do that. And to do the same with, with SEO means you're just guessing. So that's where it becomes more expensive. I'd rather be very specific, get my users, have a user base, make my users stay longer than 10 months and then use right. the profits to go and do more SEO. Right, right, right. So, I mean, as you always, of course, advocate SEO is more of a product rather than just a service, right? Yes, always. Always, oh, right, right. So I know you wrote a book the link of which, of course, is in the uh, comment section below. But do you, any other books you recommend? Do you read books a lot? Yes, I yeah. try to read it. Yeah, I try to read every SEO book and every business book I can come across. I just read Alex Ramosi's Million Dollar Offers. I know that people are not so into Alex Ramosi. They, they think he's... No, I, I have read both. <laughs> I'm right now reading uh, Million Dollar Leads. Yes, I think there's a lot that could be taken from it. Yes. I read. Uh, I try to read as many SEO books as possible. Um, I was a technical reviewer, the big SEO book. And I'd say, you know, read read books. I would read any book on SEO. I read Nathan Gotch's book, of course. I read Jason Hennessy's two books on SEO. So there's always something to be learned. And I think anybody that feels like they know everything around SEO, then they're they're done learning and they're not going to be a good SEO. I, I read books on, you know, I read um, Wolfram Alpha wrote a book, great book on what, uh, what ChatGPT is and how it works. So try to read as much in these, oh, you know, any marketing area as possible. Oh, and for agencies, I would right. strongly recommend the book, Never Split the Difference, which is a negotiation book. Okay, I'll put the link to, <laughs> to the book in the description below. Right, are there any up upcoming projects or initiatives you are working on that you are particularly excited about? So, yes, I'm writing a new book on understanding users and buyer journeys. No, no ETA on that. It's sort of being loosely written now. And then, of course, follow my newsletter because that's where I'm doing all my writing. So it's productletseo.com. That link is also in the description below. Okay. And eventually I will have a course. So I'll have a course on, on really, on, on how, on frameworks for SEO. So you do not have a course right now, it's just a newsletter. Just a newsletter, yeah. Okay. I think you should take some lead from Nathan on that. Yes. <laughs> he does a good course and make a good money out of it. <laughs> right. Yes. All right. Thank you so much, Eli, for sharing your insights with us today. And it's been a pleasure having you on the show. And where can our listeners find more about you and your work and get in touch with you besides product led SEO. Check out my yeah, check out my LinkedIn. Obviously, yeah. productledseo.com is my newsletter. And then okay. anything always happy to answer any messages and, and anything and answer any questions. And whatever you do, just you know, focus on your buyer journey and your users. And for SEO agencies out there, I think SEO is as safe as can be 
if you think into the future and don't think right. about the now. Right, right, right. Uh, that's it for today's episode of the Agency Insider. And thank you for tuning in and we'll see you the next time. Thank you, Navi.